Hello, welcome to the lab. We're going to try to make a Rossby wave today and examine some of its properties. So what we're seeing here is the familiar rotating table apparatus with the co-rotating camera and the image in the rotating frame in the monitor here. What's special about the setup I've got here is that if you look in cross-section, you can see there's actually a cone sitting on the bottom of the tank. So there's a sloping bottom. And what this gives us is a fluid that's shallower toward uh, the center of the circle, or what's effectively the pole in this rotating system, and deeper out toward the, the equatorward edge. And so this gives us something very much analogous to a beta effect. Well, it is a beta effect. It's what we call a topographic beta. Uh, because uh, the, the, the lengthening uh, of the um, fluid columns as we move out radially outward is quite analogous to the lengthening of fluid columns parallel to the Earth's axis of rotation as you move from the pole to the equator. So this system, when it's motionless in the relative sense as it is now, has a PV gradient just like we have on the spherical Earth. Um, and so this is in fact a way to create a beta plane, a real physical beta plane here in the laboratory. And what I've got, what you can probably see on that cone is a bump that's spinning around. It's a, a plastic little bump that's been attached to the side of the cone. And so what we're actually gonna do here, the experiment itself is to, um, induce a flow in the tank by adjusting the, the motor. Okay, it's in solid body rotation right now. In fact, we're gonna visualize that by going and grabbing some of these paper dots here. And I'm just gonna put a few floating on the surface, just like that. And now we can see if it's in solid body rotation by turning our attention to the rotating frame and asking, are those dots stationary? And the answer is not exactly. There's a, actually, I can see a little bit of what looks like inertial oscillations there, as a dot seems to be kind of moving back and forth. At least it's a pretty small motion, so I'm gonna call this more or less ready to go. But my experiment is going to be, if I look down here at the meter, it says, 15.8, it's 15.8 uh, RPM, rotations per minute. I am gonna to attempt to use the control knob to turn the speed down by about one RPM. And that's gonna induce a relative motion in the tank because the water has some inertia and so it's going to be spinning at about 15 RPM while the tank is spinning at about 14. And then we're going to see what happens when this relative motion has to account or interact with the bump in the presence of this beta effect. And so this is in so, some ways analogous to how planetary waves on Earth are actually forced by the fact that uh, the mean flow has to traverse over mountain ranges. So before I actually um, induce that relative motion, we're gonna put some dye in. So I've got my red dye, and I'm just gonna put a few dots, kind of in a, an annulus of sorts, just so we can get some idea. Whoops. When I do induce a relative motion, what happens? So I've got my blobs of red, Okay, so we'll keep our eye on those. And if I look in cross-section here, as usual, the red is kind of not quite buoyant, not quite sinking. It's somewhere, it's, it's pretty neutral. So it's sort of lazily mixing itself vertically. But we have some evidence here of, of the vertical rigidity that we've become used to. So here I go, I'm gonna start the experiment. So I'm going to, I might have pushed it too hard. We went from, 15.8 to 13.8. So I actually induced a change of two RPM, but let's look what happens and let's turn our attention to the rotating frame. 
And let's think about what we think ought to happen. As the flow traverses, we can see the, the, the barrier in the images right here. As the flow traverses that barrier, those columns shrink, right? As the fluid is pushed over top of the barrier, if it went in a straight line, the column would get smaller. And so we see evidence of the fluid uh, going equatorward, if you like, to preserve its length. And as the fluid traverses equatorward to where the water is deeper, well, then it finds itself in a situation where it's experiencing that restoring force associated with that topographic beta effect. And what emerges is something with a fairly well-defined wavelength. And so it's in the downstream of that barrier that I see this wave-like structure appearing. And I'm going to try to estimate its wavelength. Um, so I have something like a distance from here to here is basically one wavelength. And that distance, if I look, you're not here to see this in person, but if I look in the tank, that distance, I'm going to estimate that to be about 10 centimeters, just by eye. Okay, so there we have it. That's really all we wanted to see was the emergence of um, some well-defined sort of excursion north and south that we can trace whose existence we can trace to the, the, this beta effect, this background PV gradient. And it's not going to last long. It's already kind of getting dissipated because, of course, that wave owed its existence to the fact that there was some relative velocity that was infecting fluid parcels over top of that bump. And that gets spun down pretty quickly uh, due to frictional effects here inside the tank. Um, so there's not too much to see anymore, just for fun. We can try to induce one more relative motion by slowing down the motor again. And we can look at, now it's, it's very complicated now because the existing die patterns were complicated. But you can certainly see again the biggest disturbance uh, to what's otherwise a pretty zonal flow or sort of uh, azimuthal flow is right um, at the bump and downstream of the bump, where the consequences of conserving PV really come into play. So that's it for the laboratory, but we can think about um, you know, whether that 10 centimeter wavelength is, you know, at least in the ballpark that some simple theory would predict it to be. So we'll look at that if we have a chance.